right, what's up everybody? How are we doing today? We're back with another smart lore reading for you guys. This is I'm introducing Ishtar. This is from the Odyssey of the Soaring Isles. Good to see. So, but we're here for the lore, right? So let's get this. Let's get this started. So this is Queen of Heaven. I wonder if they're gonna add more as they release more. Of the opposite. I guess we'll find out one way or another. Alright, so Queen of Heaven. <laughs> Gilgamesh, King of Uruk, settled back on his throne and resisted the urge to sign. His vizier continued to drone on about whatever dull matter of state had preoccupied him to this day. It was always something new. Rarely, however, was it something exciting. Once, Bean King had men slaying monsters and battling wild men, but he had given up his throne and journeyed into the underworld in search of the secret to immortality. Though he had not found the answers he sought, he had returned wiser than he had left. <sighs> Once, Bean King had men... Oh, sorry. The world had changed in his absence, where Uruk remained, awaiting her king. He intended to be a good one, and to make most of the second chance fate had given him. If only it wasn't so dreadfully boring. Gilgamesh's head rocked back and forward, and he did his best to support his head, support it with his fist. Despite the tedium, he did his best to listen. Yeah, it was the least that he could do. And yet, even as he tried to focus, he felt something nag at him. A pull on his attentions, his senses, like his strength were semi-divine. He could hear something approaching, like the beating of great wings or the scrape of footsteps. The pressure of that approach built in his skull, making it hard to concentrate. His eyes flicked to his sword, resting against his throne. He was reaching for the weapon, even as the doors to his throne were smashed. No, it's right. <clears throat> He was reaching for the weapon, as even as the doors to his throne room were smashed open with a thunderous boom, two crackling arrows cut through the air and pierced his robes, pinning him to his throne. Even as he ripped himself free, his attacker stormed into the throne room, her eyes blazing with, with fury. The crowd of supplicants and courtiers melted away before her divine wrath, fleeing in all directions. Traitor, Ishtar. Queen of Heaven snarled as she readied her third arrow. Gilgamesh flung himself from his throne as he loosed, as she loosed the arrow. It passed over his head and split his throne in two. He came to his feet, sword at the ready, bewildered by a sudden attack. Have I done something to offend you, my lady? He called out, excited and confused in equal measure. He yearned for something to break the TD, but the ang an angry goddess at his doorstep was highly unexpected. In reply, Ishtar charged towards them, her footsteps echoing throughout the rapidly emptying throat. As she did so, she flung aside her bow and drew her twin blade sheathed across her back. The blades flashed out, and Gilgamesh interposed with his sword at the last moment. Ishtar continued her attack, slashing and stabbing, driving him back as much through sheer relentless ferocity as a martial skill. His mind whirled as he sought to keep her at bay. It wasn't easy. Ishtar was a goddess of war, among other things. His return to the mortal world had not come without cost. A bargain had been struck. The gods of Babylon had promised him that which he most desired. In return, all he had to do was bind Tiamat herself, the mother of gods. Simple enough request, really, but one that proved to have complications. The world had not been as simple as it recall, nor had Tiamat precisely the monster of legend. Instead of doing battle, he had chosen another path, 
one that would almost certainly not please the gods when they learned of it. While he had been prepared in some form of retribution, a direct assault on his person had been the last thing he had been worried about. Normally acted through intermediate the gods normally acted through intermediaries. They sent monsters to do the dirty work. They didn't come here in person. Then Ishtar always had been impulsive. Even her fellow gods feared her drawing her ire. There were a few links Ishtar would not go to when she thought she had been provoked. He knew from that painful experience. He ducked the blow meant to sever his head from his body and retreated. <laughs> this reminds me of our courtship, he said, with forced tears. Ishtar glared at him, scraping her blades together angrily. You're still not mad about that, are you? He had added. She lunged, quicker than he could follow. She was a goddess, after all. And though his blood was semi-divine, he could not match her speed. It was all about all he could do to keep her at a distance. Going on the offensive against her would be all but impossible. Ishtar had him at more than a physical disadvantage. Striking her, injuring her, would result only in her fellow gods turning their unwelcome attentions on him and his, bet and his people. Uruk had been getting along just fine without the interference of the Babylonian pantheon. As far as Gilgamesh was concerned, the gods ought to keep their domain to their domains and leave the day-to-day -day business to the world to those who lived on it. But if he didn't defend himself, she might destroy both he and the city he ruled out of sheer petulance. Ishtar had never lost a battle, at least not, at least not that she had been ever admitted. If she was here attacking him, she intended to humble him at the very least, and she wouldn't be satisfied until she had done so. Once, the idea would have incensed him, driving him, driven him in the past up to the edge of re reason. But these days, he had a new understanding of the world, and his place in it. He had not seen what the wars of the gods were meant for those who worshipped them. Whoever won, it was inevitably mortals who suffered the most. That thought was uppermost in his mind when he let his sword dip. As he did so, he had hoped he was not making a mistake. If he was, Ishtar would no doubt ensure that it was his last. She seized the opening and pressed the tips of her blades to his exposed throat. She forced him back against the pillar and stared at him. Her expression was contorted, softened, and became neutral. She stepped back. She rubbed his throat. He rubbed his throat and watched her wear it. I remember you fighting harder last time, she said. She looked up at him and down, as if trying to recall the last time they met. I was a fool then, he said. Then? What about now? She gestured with one of her blades. We sent you back to the mortal world for a reason, Gilgamesh. Yet here I find you lolling on your throne, without care in the world. <laughs> I was hardly lolling, he protested. Ishtar waved his words aside and sheathed her sword. Whatever you were doing, it wasn't as important as what we sent you to do. She fixed him with a steely gaze. Explain yourself, now. Ishtar studied Gilgamesh with a considering eye. Something was different about him. The king she remembered had been a callow creature, arrogant, foolhardy. But the man before her was something else. Calm, disciplined. She found the change unsettling and, she, and intriguing in equal measure. At her words, Gilgamesh drew himself up. I have nothing to explain, he said. You sent me nowhere. We made a bargain. I chose not to fulfill it. That's not how I remember it, she said. There was the arrogance she remembered, but only a trace. She looked away, gazing about her gazing about as her her as his throne at his throne too. much less grand than she remembered but more open less like a temple but more like a council chamber once Gilgamesh had himself 
thought himself equal to the gods, or at least deserving of that equality. His people still raised their voices in worship and burnt offerings, but Gilgamesh himself no longer seemed interested in godhood. She sniffed and looked back at him. Then you never did know how to show us the proper deference. Gilgamesh didn't reply. His silence infuriated her. He had been many things, but never silent. His arrogance and bellicose na nature had never made him a fine tool for her pantheon. She had argued against him all the time. She had argued against it at, at the time, but believing that Tiamat could be the only contained by the gods who had changed her in the first place. But the other Babylonian gods had been too fearful, too worried about what a clash between themselves and Tiamat might do to the world. They had hoped Gilgamesh would at least weaken the ancient dragon somewhat, giving them time to come up with another way of defeating her, one that did not involve direct confrontation. Instead, nothing had happened. Or rather, something had happened, but they didn't know what. Things had changed somehow, in some ineffable fashion. It, it was as if the world had reordered itself without their knowledge or input. The others were content, were content to debate the nature of what had occurred, but she had enough of their inaction. It did not matter if the world had changed or how it changed. All that mattered was that Tiamat was still free. If the others would not act with her, she would do so alone. It would not be the first time she had been forced to take matters in her own hand. She cocked her head, looking at Gilgamesh up and down. Once she thought to make him her consort, but she, he had refused that honor. At the time, she put it down to hubris. She bared her teeth and tugged at Anna's beard. A playful gesture, but a painful one, as evidenced by his wits. I should tear the city down around your ears, little king, she purred. If for no other reason than to remind you who your betters are. I am well aware of my place in the scheme of things, Gilgamesh said. Slowly. He met her gaze, and again, she was struck by the calm of his eyes. Where was the tempest of the old, roaring fire that had matched her own? In those days, they would have seen two of a kind, both unsatisfied by what they had granted him, both desirous of new conquests, new challenges. But it was obvious he was no longer that man. Disappointed, she released his beard and stepped back. Whatever the reason, we have not done as we demanded. Why? Tiamat and I came to an arrangement, Gilgamesh said, rubbing his chin. Ishtar laughed scornfully. <laughs> an arrangement? You can no more come to an arrangement with Tiamat than you can with the sea. He smiled. Then perhaps I should try talking to the sea next, for I seem to have a gift for negotiation. She fixed him with a look. Perhaps I should cut you out your own tongue and see how well you talk then. His smile faltered, but he did not entirely bang. It did not entirely vanish. They both knew her, her threat was empty. Her anger had passed, replaced by curiosity. Explain. Gilgamesh spread his hands. She wishes to be left alone, to coexist in peace with the world and the gods who oversee him. Ishtar snorted. Tiamat was the very embodiment of chaos. Peace was beyond her. But clearly, she convinced Gilgamesh otherwise. She told you this. She did. And you believed her. I did. Why? Gilgamesh gestured about her. See for yourself. Uruk stands. Tiamat has had many opportunities to attempt to force her will upon these lands, and yet she has not. Her actions speak louder than her words. Ishtar frowned. That she has not attacked you is not proof that she did not intend to do so. Only that she is patient. She poked him in the chest. You are a fool to think otherwise, King of Auric. Tiamat could not be trusted. 
she is as changeable as a storm wind and more ferocious still. Ask her yourself then, Gilgamesh said with an air of a challenge. Ishtar glared at him for a moment as she laughed. Fine, I will. Oh snap, things are about to go down. That was pretty good. I did like I like that one. Um, you guys are gonna have to tell me what you guys think in the comments, I guess. But until then, keep an eye out for more. more well, I'll try to keep an eye out for more of these as they pop up. I'm sure there's gonna be a second chapter with the way this Odyssey is gonna be going. I think. But until then, this has been Queen of Heaven, your Smite Lord reading for the day. We hope to see you guys on the next one. Until then. Take it easy, everybody.